Hi, in this first video on genome engineering, we'll talk about methods used to manipulate DNA in the laboratory. We'll start off by talking about restriction enzymes. These are the molecules that pr produce precise cuts in DNA so that you can have molecularly defined DNA. We'll talk about gel electrophoresis. This is how we separate DNA according to size. We'll talk about southern blotting. This is how we can identify specific DNA sequences, either in a gel or other places. And we'll also talk about in situ hybridization, which we can use to detect DNA sequences or RNA sequences in complex mixtures. So the fundamental action of restriction in enzymes is to cleave DNA. There are many thousands of types of restriction enzymes, and here we see examples of how five of the most common will cut DNA. Two of the restriction enzymes have recognition sequences that are only four bases, so they'll cut very frequently. Also, they cut straight across the DNA, leaving blunt ends. So this is precisely cutting in half their recognition sequence. Again, because there are only four base pairs in the binding uh, sequence, the recognition sequence, these sequences will occur very frequently in a genome. Six pair, base pair recognition sequences are found less frequently, of course. You recall that the way we calculate how often any particular sequence would occur is to take 4 to the power of the number of bases, and this sequence would occur 1 in every 4 to the 6 base pairs. This is the, the sequence that's cleaved by the enzyme ECHOR1. And here you see that there is uh, what's called a sticky overhang. It did not cut it straight across, but it cuts it offset, leaving a few bases that can be used to hybridize as when you're trying to stitch DNA pieces back together. Here's an enzyme called NOT1, which cleaves every eight base pairs and also leaves a four base pair overhang. These are quite popular for manipulating DNA because you can put pieces back together very efficiently. One thing you'll notice of all of these sequences is that they're palindromic, meaning that the sequences GGCC, GGCC are found on both strands going in the 5' prime to 3' prime region. AAG here, AAG here. And many restriction enzymes are dimers, and this is one of the reasons for the symmetrical binding. As an engineer with thousands of different enzymes to cut DNA with thousands of different recognition sequences, you can there are tools online that help will help you select the proper enzyme to cut the DNA at the place that you want to. Even so, there are not an unlimited number of enzymes and you will frequently any enzyme that you want to cut the DNA in a specific place might also cut in additional places. So in practice it can be challenging picking the right enzyme to cut the DNA where you want it. Now that we know about the tools to cut DNA into smaller pieces, we have to use tools that will separate them so we can pick out individual pieces. The best method for this is gel electrophoresis, which will separate pieces of DNA by size. In this example, we have the genome from the lambda phage virus, which is around 40 kilobases, meaning 40,000 base pairs. And we're cutting it with two different restriction enzymes, ECHOR1 and HIN3, which we saw on the previous slide. They're both six cutters, and you might and they both seem to cut in six places in the genome. You might want to see if that's reasonable, make a calculation and see if that's reasonable. Cut pieces of DNA are loaded into a well. This is a polymer of agarose, meaning it's sort of like a gelatin mesh uh, with pores that act as obstacle courses for DNA to migrate. Uh, then you apply an electric field DNA is negatively charged. Remember, it's a polyanion, so it will proceed to the positive electrode with smaller pieces being able to navigate the gel more quickly than the larger pieces. So here we have the six fragments that of the lambda genome virus, and we could then cut out the band of any one of these and work with an individual piece of DNA. So to recap, we take a defined piece of DNA, but which is too large to handle easily. We cut it into smaller pieces, then we separate those smaller pieces on the gel. 
allowing us to identify individual pieces. Now in the laboratory, the way that we do this is, or we see these individual pieces, is by using ultraviolet illumination. And into the bath, we'll add a fluorescent dye, which binds to the DNA, and that fluoresces, and that indicates where the pieces of DNA are. It appears as a pink color here in this photograph. So now that we've been able to cut specific pieces of DNA and separate them, we're going to do things that will help us identify the identity of various pieces or the nature of various pieces. And almost everything we're going to be doing from here on out in engineering is going to rely on sequence-specific hybridization for identifying uh, specific pieces. And this is exemplified that if you take uh, two pieces of DNA and heat it up to very high temperatures, uh, they will dissociate, they will become monomeric, and then if you allow them to cool, they will basically identify each other and uh, rehybridize as the temperature slowly cools. This is an example of molecular recognition due to complementary base pairing. So now let's see how we can use this to our advantage. Let's say we would like to identify a specific piece of DNA. For instance, let's say we want to identify uh, one particular gene from a human genomic DNA. Well, we're, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take human genomic DNA, we're going to cut it with a restriction nuclease, and then we're going to separate it out on a gel. Now for the lambda genome, it, which is very small, 40,000 base pairs, we saw discrete cuts. For humans with 3 billion base pairs, even an 8-cutter, a very rare 8-cutter, is going to produce so many bands that you will not visualize individual bands. You'll just see this uh, smear that extends over the length of the gel. On this, in this fourth lane, you've put a marker. You've put in known DNA samples which have bands at certain certain number of base pairs, and that will help guide you and help you know where on the gel you stand or how big a, a piece that you're going to identify is. So we can't do very much with the DNA in a gel, so we have to get it out into a more usable format. And what we're going to do is we're going to get that stuck on a very thin, positively charged piece of plastic. Plastic is called nitrocellulose. And if, as you might know, nitro groups are positively charged. Negatively charged DNA will bind to it very tightly. Uh, the DNA was loaded here in a well. It was migrating and by, driven by an electric field. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take the gel. We're going to put this piece of plastic right on top of it. And we're going to put stacks of paper towels behind there and uh, have a water bath down in the bottom. And we're going to just draw water up here by osmosis into the paper towels. And that's going to be enough to carry the DNA from the gel onto the piece of plastic, which is now on a surface rather than embedded in a gel mesh. It's on a surface, and now we can probe that, and we'll do that on the next slide. So a few things before we go to that, I want to just mention that the two steps we've done here, we've separated DNA using electrophoresis, and we've transferred the DNA to a nitrocellulose membrane. Since we'll be probing for DNA sequences, this is called southern blotting after the scientist who discovered it, Edward Southern. Taking off on his name, uh, people will start using points of the compass. Northern blotting is if you're blotting for RNA sequences, and Western blotting is if you're going to do some blotting for protein. They all share the basic outline of separating something based on its size and then using a recognition molecule to identify it. So here we've taken our piece of plastic, which has the DNA transferred onto it. We put it into a small bag, which has a small amount of liquid inside. And we also have a probe. We know a little bit of the DNA sequence of the gene we're trying to find. We've made it radioactive. We will let it just infuse it into the gel. We've treated the DNA on the, on the plastic um, by heat or sodium hydroxide to make it single-stranded. And so this probe will bind 
to the sequence it'll it'll after a long time it will find nucleic acid sequences which are complementary have complementary bases and it will bind to it because of the radioactivity you can put a piece of film right on top of it and the radioactivity will emit photons and you'll be able to see uh, specific bands in different locations from different samples so steps three and four are incubate the membrane with a DNA probe sequence and four develop an image uh, that's going to reveal where the probe sequence has sat down so now that we've developed the ability to identify a specific DNA sequence what might we want to do with it well one thing that people used to do a lot is probe for DNA mutations using this technique uh, in this example we have the example for sickle cell anemia again the first molecularly characterized gene where a single base pair change uh, takes a surface residue of glutamic acid and switches it to a valine which puts a hydrophobic amino acid right on the surface and will allow the proteins to polymerize inside a red blood cell causing the sickling shape which causes the normally round or more precisely biconcave disc shape of the red blood cell into this weird elongated shape which then causes problems so how are we going to identify whether you have the normal sequence or the uh, mutant sequence well we're going to use two different probes uh, one probe for the normal gene one probe for the mutated gene and we're going to take in this case we have three individuals individuals one two and three we're going to load their DNA here's for person one on both gels person two person three and then we'll probe for the normal gene then we develop it and here are the steps that we've done in, in the whole southern blotting process this probe for the normal gene will bind here in position one it does not the it the person one does not have the sickle cell gene so they are homozygous wild type for the normal condition person two has none of the normal gene and has the sickle cell gene so it has the mutation so this person person is homozygous recessive and they have sickle cell anemia person number three is a carrier it's heterozygous it has one copy of the the wild type sequence and one copy of the mutated sequence so they have a condition called sickle cell trait and are probably not much affected by it however they as you know are protected from malaria by having that sickle cell trait now you might wonder and you would be correct in thinking that shouldn't this band which has two chromosomes with because the, they're homozygous wild type be twice as heavy as this band for the mutation uh, that is true um, because here person three has one chromosome that's normal and one chromosome that's diseased but the intensities of the bands are not that reliable that you would um, necessarily make that call you would make that call by using both probes rather than intensities here now another way of using hybridization is if you're looking for the relative orientation of several genes on a chromosome during metaphase when these chromosomes are nice and compact you can add fluorescently in this example fluorescently labeled uh, DNA probe molecules here's one for the telomere sequences and then you have one two three four different genes that are being probed and you're able to see their relative uh, orientation a chromosome and you might like to know the relative order of the four genes to check if that person has had a chromosomal inversion which can happen and can be associated with various disease states now you can also do hybridization experiments to detect the expression of a gene in various situations on the left we have a thin slice from an organ and this dark blue color that you can you can see certain cell outlines here and you can see that this gene is being expressed in certain locations but not others this is just background amounts of blue so for a gene that you're interested in you've developed a probe which has in this case an enzyme which is going to produce a blue substrate attached to the DNA molecule that DNA molecule will bind to mRNA that's present in the cells and produce the blue color there you can also do in situ hybridization in terms of whole mounts 
This is a study that's looking at mouse limb uh, development. So these are different stages of mouse development. And you can see that in the limb bud, which is eventually becoming fingers, there is the expression pattern of four different genes being looked at. And you can right away deduce that all four of these proteins, or at least three of them, these genes have, are playing significant roles in the development of digits on the forelimb. Now one technical issue that you have to confront here is if you want to bind specifically to the RNA, how are you going to avoid binding to the genomic DNA, right? Because the RNA is copied from the genomic DNA. I don't want to put in my probe and have it bind anywhere in the genome. So you might say, well, what sequences are in the RNA that's not in the DNA? And the answer to that comes when you have genomic DNA. Remember a gene, you have exons, you have introns. So here's two exons and an intron in between it and then when you uh, produce the RNA sequence you're gonna splice out the intron and join the two exons and so then here at the junction you have a, a unique sequence that even though it's copied from the genome it this short sequence is only going to be present in the RNA because you have half the sequence here and half the sequence here so most of the probes done to detect mRNA uh, in cells or in whole mounts are going to be directed at exon junctions because those are the unique sequences. This is going to limit the amount of binding to the background DNA that's present in every cell. Okay, so that's just a few of the ways that we're going to use hybridization to do things molecularly with DNA, and we'll see many more examples in the future uh, videos. Thank you for listening.